next few weeks we're going to focus we're going to focus on the message of Christmas, the message of the first coming of Jesus. We're going to look at it in context of the world in which it happened and see how the God is at work in the uh, history and the affairs of men, leaders and kings and people going about their everyday life doing what they do. And yet God is at work. He is working behind the scenes. He's bringing to pass His plan and His purposes. Amen. And that will be an encouragement to us because we're going to see that the people that were involved in the coming of Jesus were just people going about their everyday affairs, their everyday lives, and yet God came on the scene and used them in the context of their lives. Very normal, routine things, like paying taxes. We can all relate to that, right? Or like going to work. None of us are shepherds, but we all have a routine that we have to do, that kind of the day-to-day -day things, or, you know, cutting the lawn, washing the car, just going about everyday things. And what we see is that a mighty God, a very supernatural and uh, not everyday kind of God, the, the creator of the universe, is able to work in the everyday lives of everyday people and bring about his purpose and his plan. Amen. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your help today. Holy Spirit, you are the author of the scriptures. You breathed these scriptures in and through the men that sat and wrote them. Lord, we want to we want to receive the truth that you intended, God, when you had these men to sit and write. We want to, we want to receive the truth that is able to yes. transform our lives. Yes. Lord, I pray that you'll help us today. Build us up. Strengthen us through your word. And wash us through your word. <coughs> we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go chapter 2. Verse 1, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Kings are always making decrees, right? Presidents are making decrees. That's what they do. They're always standing in front of a great crowd of people or on television and just like, you know, the teacher on Charlie Brown. They talk and they talk and they make decrees. Caesar made a decree that went out that all the world should be registered. This census took place first while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her, forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And we'll stop there today. The, the, uh, Luke, as I said last week, wrote his gospel. And one of the things Luke focuses on again and again in his gospel is he's trying to, as we try to get into the heart of this man and is what his intentions are as he writes this gospel. You know, when you write a letter to somebody, there's a context, there's something happening 
in, in your life and relationship with that person. And you write that letter to address those issues that you want to speak to that person. And if I were to find your letter two years later and go through a drawer and find the letter and read it, I may get to understand something of what you were saying, but I wouldn't understand the fullness of what you were trying to say to that person unless I knew the circumstances surrounding the, 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 uh, you writing that letter. And if I just took a few sentences out of it and lifted it out and tried to understand those few sentences without the whole letter and without the whole context, I could seriously be misunderstanding what it was you were trying to say. Why? Because I don't have the picture. The, the letter is not laid back into the context, the history in which you wrote it. And so these men wrote their Gospels in the first century. There were political things going on. There were military things going on. There were things going on, current events that were happening in the world. And Luke is explaining and sharing some of those things. But what is his purpose in writing the gospel? He wants men in that society. He wants men and women. When I say men, I mean mankind. His intention is to communicate with the world what has just happened, remember, Jesus, when Luke writes his gospel, it was not long ago that Jesus hung on the cross and had risen from the dead. It wasn't 2,000 years ago. It was within his lifetime. These things had just happened. And he is now declaring to the world that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was sent. He was sent. But one of Luke's favorite titles that he uses when he writes his gospel is Son of Man. Son of Man. You see that more in Luke's gospel than any of other, the other gospels. The phrase, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. The Son of Man. Why? Because Jesus came to the world to become a man. To become one of us. To experience the everyday drudgery and struggle of life that you and I experience and to come and to lift us up out of that into something of a greater reality and that reality is the kingdom of God and we are more than the sum of our parts and what we see every day but we are not just physical beings that live in this physical plane and do these things but we are spiritual beings and we have come from uh, the kingdom, we've been sent by God, we've been given life by God, and we are one day going to return to Him. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on. Enjoy the Lord. Yeah. So Luke writes his gospel, and he tells us of the account of the coming of Jesus. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, I'm reading again for a purpose, that all the world should be taxed. Luke tells us in these few verses that at the coming of Jesus, Caesar, who was the mightiest emperor on the earth at the time, Rome was in control, Rome had dominated the world, and Rome was occupying Israel. Uh, Rome was occupying. Israel was underneath the boot of the, uh, the Roman government. There was soldiers stationed in Israel occupying that land. They were a foreign presence and they were exacting monies and tribute from the, from the Jews. And Caesar makes a decree. All the world's going to be taxed. Maybe they wanted to you know, build a summer home in the south. Who knows what they needed more money for. But just like politicians do, they make decisions and decrees many times ignorant of or not caring about the effects that their decrees will have on the everyday man. Amen. And he makes his decree and it goes out across the world. And you didn't want to defy the Roman government. You didn't want to stay, say no. That was not a, a smart thing to do. And it just so happens that while this decree goes out that all the world should be taxed in order to be registered, they had to 
go back. They couldn't just pay the tax where they lived. But now there's a massive redistribution of the population as people are now having to uproot and to travel back to their, the, the town of their birth. Now there's no mass communication, uh, transportation, there's no subway, there's no planes to, I'm going to fly, I'll be back tomorrow. It was, we need to load up the family, we need to load up all that we have, and we need to go out over the, the dusty roads of uh, Judea and over the dusty roads of Israel and travel back. And Joseph, this news could not have come at a more inconvenient time in the life of Mary and Joseph. She is great with child. She is going to have a baby. She is ready to be delivered. But the decree doesn't make exception for that. She must now get on a, a mule or an animal and make the trip. Can you see the picture of it? Can you see the picture of this pregnant woman going across whatever she has to go to, her husband leading her back? Why? Because the decree went out. And sometimes in our lives, we can feel like our lives are just going along, that we're just bouncing along. We're going through this and we're going through that. There are things happening in the world scene that affect our lives, that affect us, that have an effect on us. Presidents and senators making decrees and making decisions raising taxes, doing this, doing that. And here we are, the common people who are going about our business, trying to serve the Lord the best we can. And we are affected by these things that happen around about us. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were here, or there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Now the word in there is really a bad translation. Anyone have anything else in your Bible besides in? Does it say house? Because you, all of us have seen the uh, traditional picture of them coming to an inn like a, like a Hotel Six, you know, like a hotel on the side of the road and no vacancy. <laughs> but what was actually happening in the custom of the day, many Jewish people, many Hebrews who lived in the area, they had a home <clears throat> and there was a compartment that was reserved for visitors, for family members that would be traveling. And it's a very, it's the same, the same uh, word that where the, uh, the, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, when he said he took him to an inn, took the, the man that was injured to an inn. He didn't take him to a hotel. He took him to someone's home that would have this room reserved for family members that would come traveling many miles that would come back home. And during this time, because of the tax, the registration, the family members had already come back home. There were probably other family members who were already there, and it was already packed. Now, if I could show you a picture of this, this home, and I'll try and find one this week and show it to you next week. They lived in homes that were two level, and on the top level was where the family lived. And then down below, they would have a ladder. And down below would be the area where the animals were kept in the same house. <clears throat> it wasn't like a barn out, you know, 
It was a one-room house with two levels. And down below would be the provisions for the house, and there would be a, the feeding trough, and there would be the area for the animals. And they would bring them in at night if they had a few animals when it was cold out, so they would bring them in to keep them out of the elements. So when it says that Jesus, when the, the, the family of Jesus came back to the town of Bethlehem, there was no room. There was no place for them to stay in that, that little room that was a, a, attached to the house. They stayed downstairs. And the Bible says that when he was born, they laid him in that manger. Now, a manger is not a not something filled with hay. The, the manger is actually made of stone. Yeah. It was a stone. It was like a rectangle with, with uh, dug out so it could hold water yeah. or it could hold food. It was really the feeding place of the animals. But if you look at it, it is like the perfect place to when a baby is born. See, these people, you're talking about people that worked in the fields. These are not American women who go to a, a birthing suite and have, you know, epidurals and all of this. These are people who worked out in the field. They would give birth to a child, go back and work in the field the same day. So she gave birth to her son. She laid him in the manger. Laid him in that. And it becomes a sign. It becomes a sign later when the angel says to the shepherds, go, you'll find the baby laying in a manger. <clears throat> laying in, why would it be such a sign? Because no one had ever seen a baby laying in a manger. No one had ever seen anybody lay a, a child in that feeding trough before. Now what is the message? Number one, God uses life. God uses experiences that are going on around about us to move us to where he wants us to be. They were in Nazareth in Galilee. The prophet said that Jesus would be born where? In Bethlehem, the city of David. And here is Caesar standing, thinking he's in control. Let me put out a tax on all the people. But God is at work in the backgrounds, moving his, his people to where they need to be because the time of the birth of his son is at hand and he must be born not in Nazareth or in Galilee. He must be born in Bethlehem. And so God is at work behind the scenes, orchestrating what is going on in everyday occurrences, things that are very common and very normal to get his people to where they need to be. Check it out in the scriptures. Many of the people that were called, were called of God, were called in the context of doing what they did every day. Being faithful to what they were called to do. Being faithful to what they were appointed to do. Moses was tending the sheep when he saw a, a burning bush. God called him out of the context of doing what he did every day. Joseph was faithful in Pharaoh's court, doing everything that he did every day. He was thrown into prison. And in the context of being faithful, even in prison, Pharaoh called when he heard that there was somebody that could interpret dreams. Again and again, God's people were called in the context of doing everyday things. God is in control. Don't ever think that because you feel like you're just going through the day-to-day, -day, the routine of your life, that God is not attentive to your life. He is vitally, intimately concerned with your life, and he is working on your behalf even in the routine of life. Even in the struggles of life, even in seemingly some of the unfair things of life, as this tyrant brings down a tax, yet God is, while this is being decreed, God is at work in their lives. You see, no one can obliterate the plan of God for your life because God has authorized and planned your life. 
He has planned your days. He has planned your future. The only one who can nullify God's plan in your life is you. You can say no to the plan of God. But if you say yes to God and you say, I'm going to be faithful, I'm just going to keep serving you, no matter what goes on, whatever right. it comes down, God will bring you through into the place where he is intended for you to be. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Number two, Joseph then went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth. Number two. Yeah. God uses everyday people to accomplish his ends. Now, we look at this, and to us, Joseph is not everyday people. I've been hearing about Joseph and Mary all of, our, all of my life. And so have you, and we hold them in a place of honor because they are were the, the people that God chose to bring his son into the world. But if you'll go with me back to the context of the culture at the time, Joseph was a carpenter. He was just another carpenter. He was just another guy doing his work. He was another woman having a baby, another Jewish woman having a baby. And here God is working in behalf of their lives and he is working in and through them. The truth is, is that God causes normal, common people to accomplish uncommon things. And that's why he does it, because when there is success, when there is fruit, when there is success, when God brings something to pass, it doesn't become mistaken who gets the glory, who gets the credit. Because it wasn't the man, it wasn't the woman, it was the God who called the man. It was the, wo the God who right. called the woman. It was the God behind the scenes. It was the Lord who was empowering and enabling them and setting the stage and preparing things for them. You know, sometimes people say, man, I can't do much for God because I'm not... Um, you know, God didn't call you to be an imitation of some great evangelist. He already called him. He only needs one of him. He called you because you're the only you there is. He called you because you're the only one who can do what he's called you to do. He doesn't want my imitation of David Wilkerson or Billy Graham. He doesn't need another Billy Graham. He needs Chuck to be obedient and faithful to what God has called Chuck to do. He needs you to be faithful to what he's called you to do. And he will do mighty things through your life. Not in the world's eyes. Listen, this birth came to pass and the world just, they didn't even blink. We're going to see later that it wasn't announced to kings. It wasn't announced to, to uh, Caesar. It wasn't announced to, you know, there was, there was no great... You know, entourage, there was no big hype. My son is born and blow the trumpets. It was no, a little right. town called Bethlehem. Yeah. What we used to call a one light town. You know, if you blink and you go through it, you miss it. It was a little town. A little town. And unless God had announced it to the shepherds, nobody would. So it was the mother there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. She brought forth, forth her first son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Every time I meditate on this, I think about it. You know, you think of the, the birth of... Uh, one of the prince's children over in, in England. Boy, it's heralded. It's, uh, you know, can you imagine one of those guys letting your child be born in a barn with animals and laid in a feeding trough for animals? But this is the king, the creator of the universe, the creator of the world became not just a man, he became a baby. How? Huh? My favorite three words, I don't know. 
I don't know, but the, the gospel declares that he became a man. He became a child. Mm -hmm. And he submitted himself to weakness, to want, to the care of his earthly parents. He submitted himself to the elements. He submitted himself to all of that. Mm -hmm. And he came in quietness. He came in humility. He came almost without notice. But because he came, he has transformed the world. He has transformed the world. The gospel, this gospel, has transformed the world. You know, without this gospel, we would still be in tremendous darkness. The world is in a dark place. But because the, the light of the gospel came, there is hope. Things have been changed. You know, people make a lot of accusations against the gospel, but most of that is against churchianity. It's true that those who claim to be followers of this gospel have done atrocious things across the world. That's true. But the gospel, the, the message of God's Son coming to the world, it has transformed the world. It has brought light and hope into the world. That's right. Because of the gospel that the gladiator games ceased in Rome. It's because of the gospel. It's because of the gospel, because of the truth of the light of God's word that slavery has been abolished in the world. So well, well, it took a long time. Yeah, it takes a long time for men to wake up to the light of the gospel and become obedient. And we're not going to see the fullness of of the effects of the gospel until we're in the kingdom. Yeah, until right. we're in the kingdom. Yeah. But the gospel has brought light right. and hope. Yes. Yes. How many of us would have be hopeless? We'd have been dead and been buried a long time ago except right. for the hope of the gospel, the right. hope yeah. of the reality that Jesus became a man and right. lived on this earth and died on the cross for me. That is the message that Luke is trying to say to us that in the everyday, in the everyday course of time and the history of the world and all that's going on and all the darkness and all the sin, God brought forth his son. He brought forth the hope. He brought forth the light. He brought forth the deliverance. It was all in that little child that was being placed in that animal fear. Don't ever let the enemy minimize in your life what happened when Jesus Christ came into your heart. When I became a child of God, when I became born again, it was just a, another day, routine day of my life. I was going on about my business. You were going on about your business. And somehow the gospel was proclaimed to you. You came into a crisis in your life, or you came into a struggle in your life, and you turned to him. You turned to him and said, Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. Change me. I need you. I need you. And what happened? He took you seriously and he came in. He came in and what happened? He began to change your life. He began to transform your life. He set some of you free from terrible bondage and darkness. He set some of us free from things we don't want to talk any about anymore. Why? Because they're in the past. They're buried. They're in the, under the blood. We have been set free by this coming of the Son of God into our lives. Sometimes the, uh, the story of the Christmas account, to me it is so anointed. It is so anointed of the Spirit of God because it is the coming, we're going to see next week, it is the coming of the Anointed One. What was the word to Mary? What did the angel say? The spirit of the highest will overshadow you. And therefore that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God.
the Son of God, that anointing, that Spirit of God that was over, over that whole process. And then later when Jesus comes, He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to preach what? The good news to the poor. To preach freedom to the captives. To preach and to provide and restore sight to the blind. That anointing was upon him to break chains and to break darkness and to set men free from eternal death. We talk about anointing. This is not just a little Christmas card. This is the message that changes the world, that has transformed the world. And it is the message that will usher in the coming of the kingdom. Amen. Shut ourselves in with God. Today, before we go any further, the question that the Holy Spirit will ask is, have you asked Jesus into your heart? Have you asked him into your life? Have you come to the Son of God and said to him, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe the gospel. And I need you in my life. I need your love. I need your transformation. If you have not, I want to tell you that he's the only way to heaven. He's the only way to God. That's why he was sent. To give us a bridge back to God out of our darkness and out of our sin. And today, if you want to know Jesus, you can know him right here and now before you leave this place. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And God has you here today, just like he moved Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem at the right time. You're here today. That's right. God has you here today. That's right. Thank you, Lord. So today, if you hear his voice, don't hold your heart. But say yes to the Lord. If, if you want to know him, would you just raise your hand? Say, I, I want Jesus to come into my life. I'm not going to embarrass you and ask you to do anything strange. You're really raising your hand to the Lord. You're saying, I want him in my life. Steve, would you come, brother? Over the next few weeks, I'm going to ask you in your devotional time to read Luke chapter 1 and 2. Just read it, meditate on it, because we're going to be in there for the next few weeks. today to commit ourselves to God and say, Lord, I, I just want to put my trust in you and in my circumstances and the things I'm facing, things that are going on in my life, you know, family members or, or employers or anything of that nature where you feel like things are out of your control being brought into your life. We want to put our trust in God. Put our trust in Him. That He is at work. That He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're experiencing. And He is at work. He is at work in your life. He has not forgotten where you are. He knows exactly. Father, we just look to you today. Lord, thank you for this, this truth. Thank you, God, that you are at work. We ask you, Lord, 
We ask you to help us to put our trust in you, Lord. To trust you when we don't understand. To trust you when we don't like, when we when we even despise things that have been maybe been placed on us or brought into our lives because of others that are beyond our control. But Lord, we trust you today. We trust you today that you are on our side, that you are with us, Lord. Shepherds watch our keys. 